Hello, I am Gail Christopher, Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. And our organization has a vision and a mission to eliminate health inequities and to create conditions to help create conditions that will allow all people to experience optimal health and well being. But we know that the biggest barrier to achieving that mission is racism. And so as part of our work, we're helping this country to overcome racism and its harmful legacy. So today is the National Day of Racial Healing. It is the sixth annual National Day of Racial Healing. And why focus a day on racial healing? Because we need to lift up the voices for unity, for peace, for engaging communities in the process of learning how to see ourselves in the face of the perceived other. You see, America was built on a fallacy, on a hierarchy of human value, on a belief system that undergirds that hierarchy. And this country for its early centuries of development structured that belief system through the decimation of the lands and the taking of the lands of indigenous people to the forced enslavement of African people to immigration policies that were based on that racial hierarchy. So this notion of racism is built into the systems and structures of our society. And to a large measure, we're in denial about that as a root cause and a root threat to the very viability of our democracy. I spent many of my early decades in clinical practice, and I learned a lot about the complicated business of moving past denial, psychological denial of something that we view as a threat. And rest assured, the, the legacy of racial hierarchy is viewed by many as a threat and I learned that people move through denial through four primary phases. And of course, the first is to face the fact. Now we're hearing a lot these days about well, whispers of the possibility of a civil war. We're seeing surveys that talk about people believing political violence is okay. But we don't tie that, those facts into the truth of where that's coming from. We don't tie those facts back to the necessity of dealing with our legacy of racism. So the first phase of overcoming denial is facing the fact. And we have to face the fact that our country must mobilize a concerted, comprehensive effort to overcome racism. Once we face the fact, we have to also face the consequences of having adhered to this fallacy for all these centuries and COVID-19 and the, and the extreme health inequities and disparities and the costs of those health consequences, they should help us to face the consequences. But then once people get past the, the facts and the consequences, they have to face the implications and the insurrection on January 6th should have revealed to us collectively the implications of our failure to do this work. Our very democracy, the backbone of our peaceful transition of power was threatened and continues to be threatened by the exponential rise of extremist hate groups. So much so that our Department of Justice has actually had to create a special division to address what is perhaps the biggest threat to our national security today. And then the last phase of overcoming denial is facing the feelings. Because feelings and emotions, they either paralyze us or they mobilize us. So when we get into the real work of racial healing, it's a process that enables us to work through those phases of denial I have learned from clinical practice and my own work 
in designing social programs that people move past denial when they believe they have the resources that they need to overcome and to face whatever it is that, that they're afraid of. And I want us to recognize that we have the power to come together as a society and actualize the core tenets of our democracy. All people were created equal and all people should have an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that will only happen when all people and certainly the majority of people actually commit to that as our primary work. And that's what the National Day of Racial Healing is about. It's about paying attention to the unfinished business of creating an equitable society. It's about working to eliminate the permission to devalue some people and value others based on superficial characteristics. And it's about creating structures of opportunity and putting in place practices that, that understand the complexity of that work. We created the National Day of Racial Healing to fall every year annually after the day that we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. Why is that? Because it's a day that we set aside to pay attention to the reasons Dr. King both lived and died to help us as a country believe that we could create the beloved community. And the beloved community is built on valuing all people equally. I'm excited that the National Collaborative partners with many organizations who are also committed to this work. Well over 300 organizations are supporting the call for the creation of a national commission on truth, racial healing and transformation. And many other communities at a, at a city and community and county level are implementing a truth, racial healing and transformation effort. Truth, racial healing and transformation or TRHT is our version of a national truth and reconciliation process. Now, America, despite the need, has never really done that work. Over 40 other countries have had truth and reconciliation processes. So we, we were able to learn a lot from the successes and failures of those efforts in our design of TRHT. And we put racial healing right at the center of that framework. I define racial healing as our individual and collective efforts to eliminate the belief in a false ideology, a false hierarchy of human value. And most importantly, to replace that belief with a reverence for and respect and regard for our interconnected, interdependent nature as a human family. And that's work. That's learning how to see ourselves in the face of the other or the perceived other. That's learning how to be empathetic, how to be compassionate, and how to translate that empathy and compassion into standing up for justice in this country and for fair and equitable opportunities. The truth, racial healing and transformation effort is built on five pillars. And the first is narrative change. We have to tell a new story about our country, a different story, a story that lifts up the past in its authentic voices, a story that engages all people. But we also have to realize that the stories that we're hearing through social media today are stories that promote division. And we have to take the necessary policy steps and put in practice those things that will, will manage that process. We have algorithms driving our social media now that are designed to divide us. And so it's critical that we not let that narrative be so destructive and present such a risk 
to our democracy. The next pillar has to do with this work today, the work that must go on every day of building the capacity to heal. We call it racial healing. We call it relationship building. It's building our capacity to come together as a society. And then the other three pillars deal with addressing and redressing the, the legacy, the structured legacy of racial hierarchy. The first is separation. Racism is maintained through separation and it takes so many different forms. Everything from school segregation to residential redlining to the cradle to prison pipeline to child welfare disparities. Separation is a primary tool used to maintain racial hierarchy. So we have to have explicit strategies to overcome the effects of that and to stop that, to reverse it. And then the fourth pillar is overcoming and transforming a legal system that was designed to maintain racial hierarchy and not just the criminal justice system, but voting rights and immigration policies. All of these things reflect laws that embody the belief in a false hierarchy of human value. And then the fifth pillar of the framework is the economy. Understanding the costs of racism to the people who are subjected to it and to our society as a whole. So those are the five pillars of truth, racial healing and transformation, narrative change, racial healing and relationship building, separation, the law and the economy. And this work, racial healing, is right at the center of that framework because we must have a critical mass of public will. We must expand our circles of engagement on behalf of ending racism, on behalf of creating the beloved community that Dr. King wanted us to create. Now, I'm pleased to say that, you know, this isn't just theory, it's actual practice. You can visit our website of the National Collaborative for Health Equity or the American Public Health Association or the De Beaumont Foundation. We came together to create a set of briefs that can be used by communities all over this country to assess what policies and practices might they put in place to help create truth, to help tell the true authentic story of our country, to build more authentic relationships across racial lines, and to overcome the legacies of separation, to transform legal systems that are unjust, and to build economies that create equitable opportunity. So you can visit our websites, as I said, and download the Healing Through Policy Briefs that will give you very concrete examples of what is happening around this country to do this work. And so we've designed racial healing processes and circles to help optimize the perception of having the resources to face and overcome our legacy of racism. So racial healing circles are happening all across this country. They are facilitated and co-facilitated, always co-facilitated by people who are committed to holding a space a space of compassion and empathy and love so that the people who are engaged actually believe they have the resources to face the hard truths, the consequences, the implications, and those difficult feelings within a context of hope, within a context of compassion. So that's the work that's happening on the ground in communities. And we know that this is the work that we have to pay attention to. And these are the voices that we have to amplify in this country, the voices calling for unity and peace, calling for embracing our full humanity as a society, the full humanity of all of us. And we know that we must do this for ourselves and for future generations. Our democracy depends on our collective effort to heal and to transform. I hope this National Day of Racial Healing 
is an important day for you because you recognize the primacy of this work. Thank you.